you know, when I think of the Holocaust, and I mean, I'm thinking of Poland, it's what I know best. We lost 3 million Polish Jews, and we also lost the world they created. And that to honor them, it's not enough to remember how they died. We have to honor them by remembering how they live and by remembering what they created. And I think of it the way I think of Shiva. When you go to console a mourner during a Shiva, you celebrate the life of the deceased. You do not sit there and commiserate over the death. First and foremost, you honor them by honoring the memory of how they lived. I was interested in people who are wonderful conversationalists and storytellers. Right. It started with your family, yeah? Yes. I, you know, I began by recording both my mother and my father. My mother was a real treasure of Yiddish proverbs and parables that she had learned from her mother and that she used on a regular basis. Whenever there was a tense situation, she had an extraordinarily graceful, eloquent, even poetic way of diffusing the tension indirectly through these proverbs and parables. So that was really what I got from her. But for my father, it was another story. And initially, he was doing me a favor and answering my endless questions. But as time went on and he retired and he grew older, I continued to interview him and to record those interviews because it was the single most interesting conversation that I could have with him. And he had the most extraordinary memory. Neither my mother nor my father went beyond Polish public school, which means seven grades. But both of them were very intelligent, cultured, well-read, loved music. And so these conversations with my father, they really revealed a certain kind of, I would say, a very extraordinary intelligence that had to do with his way of engaging the world. He was a very, very curious person, and he was always fascinated by the world in which he lived. And as a boy growing up in Poland, this is not the era of helicopter parents. Basically, he could run around the town with his hoop, with his bicycle. He could explore every nook and cranny. And being a curious kid, he did. He explored everything. And he was blessed with an absolutely exceptional memory. I think there are you know, various ways to, to explain or to account for how it was that he could remember so much in such enormous detail and so long after he left. And so basically our conversation ran for over 40 years from 1967 till he died. And he died, I think in 2009. So it was just the best conversation I could possibly have. And being a folklorist an ethnographer trained in anthropology, ethnomusicology, sociolinguistics, the, any conversation worth having was worth recording and I recorded them. And then what happened, which I think is really very interesting and very important is that he got sick. It was quite a serious illness when he was 59 and he was worried that he might get sick again after he recovered and that my mother would be stuck with the business. So in anticipation of such an event, he retired and then he got better and he stayed better. And now he was young, even decades ago, 59 was still pretty young, and he was well. And so after a few years, he finally relented after much begging and pleading to paint what he could remember, because I knew that he had a very, very visual memory. And he began to paint what he could remember, and the paintings are extraordinary. He's a self-taught artist. He basically had never painted anything like this before. He had worked as a house painter when he first came to Canada, and he did run his own paint, wallpaper, and floor covering business. And he, he just had a flair and he would explain things to me and then make me little drawings in my notebook if I didn't understand, you know, how the water pump worked when they were putting out a fire or how to make a shoe or how to make skates or how to make a brush or whatever it was he was explaining. So I knew that he would be able to paint what he could remember if he would only have the courage to begin. And he did. He began when he was 73 years old. And he painted for the last 20 years of his life. And he left the most extraordinary collection of paintings of everything that he could remember about growing up in Poland before the Holocaust. Really, really exceptional work. So a lot of those stories that you were collecting were pre the Holocaust. And so the, what kind of what kind of era do they paint there? What kind of world do you see when you see that? Because it's a, you know, my family comes from the same place. I'm sure Priscilla's does too, you know, around the same areas. But you know, I know nothing about that area, about before the... And my the, husband as well, by the way. Yeah, Others before the well. pogroms. You know, I don't, I don't know anything about the area. You know, you, 
you just get a loose interpretation. You know, what was this rich life like there? So if we start with my father, then he is born in 1916. He's growing up during World War I and the immediate aftermath of World War I, which was absolutely devastating. And he's growing up in a town with a very large Jewish population. And that is that the pattern of Jewish settlement is that Jews settled in towns, they settled in cities, and they were urban. And wherever they settled, they formed a large percentage of the population. So in my father's case, the town is Opatov. It's uh, upt in Yiddish. The town was a, a population of 10,000, of which 6,500 were Jews. And that was quite characteristic. I mean, Warsaw, a third of the population was Jewish. Lodz, a third of the population. Krakow, a quarter. Białystok, between 50 and 70% of the population was Jewish, depending on the period. So what that means is that Jews in Poland may have been little less than 10% of the general population, but where they lived, they might even make up the majority of the population of a given town. What that does is it makes for a very coherent, very integral Jewish life within a Polish milieu. Now, what did that look like? Well, first of all, it was a very rich life, which means vibrant political parties. I mean, politics was huge and Jews did everything they could to try to achieve anything that they could at the polls. And it turns out that these political parties, Zionists, Bundes, the Jewish labor movement, the Aguda, the movement for the Orthodox Jews, although they were very, very active in electoral politics, their greatest achievement was actually in creating a whole array of institutions for their followers, summer camps, schools, interest-free loan societies, special opportunities for uh, for women to work. If you belong to the Zionist movement, you did more than simply go and vote. What you did was you had drama clubs and musical ensembles and mandolin orchestras, and you had your own schools. It was extraordinary in terms of the arts, the theater, cinema. Jews actually were pioneers in the creating of Polish cinema. The Yiddish theater was vibrant. Not uh, you know, just it was just really, it was an incredible period. And this is despite the Great Depression and economic hardship. This is despite rising anti-Semitism, especially the late 30s. Could they foresee any of what happened or were they just going? I mean, who could foresee that? Nobody you know? foresaw it. Nobody. No one foresaw it. Um, it wasn't as if in 1935 there was a plan to build Auschwitz. At some point, you decide to write this book with your dad. You know, what was that experience like after so many years? I think the beauty of my conversation with my father is that at the very beginning, it was very connected to my studies and he was doing me a favor. My mother also. It wasn't as if they were personally particularly interested, but they knew it was important to me, so they cooperated. And by 1972, that project was finished. The conversations with my father continued. And at a certain point, what had been my project became his project. So for decades, so all through the 70s and all through the 80s and through the early 90s, basically, I recorded these conversations with no goal other than to have the conversation. And I think that's probably what made them really so, so extraordinary. So I started to think about it. And by that time, he had already been painting for a few years. And it just it hit me that we could make a book. And as I put it together... I started to really conceive of this as a story told in words and images that were complementary. This would be an integrated visual, verbal way of storytelling. And then when I had really assembled the manuscript, I gave it to my father to read. And he, you know, he was really amazing. So I would say to him, well, how does it read? He'd look up and he'd say, it reads like a novel. So I knew, you know, that we had hit the jackpot. Do you get to get to a much deeper understanding of him? Did it bring you closer together? Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, the, the comparison is a ridiculous comparison, but it reminds me of Art Spiegelman and his relationship with his father, mm. which was most successful when they were working together on the graphic novel on Mouse. Yeah. And I think that a key also to my father's longevity and to his well-being, because he died when he was 93, was to have a project. And he had, a, he had a project. He had a major project. He called it his second career. Obviously, it was a way for you to really get close with him. And you were obviously 
so interested. But how much do you think he was also fueled by the, you know, absolute obliteration of a whole group of people? And the and do you feel like he had this need to preserve those details in, in just as in every single way possible, given yeah, what had absolutely. happened? Absolutely. Oh, Priscilla, I think you're you're absolutely right because he would, you know, he said, let's put it this way, lest lest the world know more about how Jews died than how they lived. And he saw himself as having an extraordinary role in conveying to future generations and to those around him what he could remember of a lost world. He definitely had the sense that this was a lost world because, in fact, he lost his family in the Holocaust. They were murdered. I mean, three weeks after I was born, all the Jews of Padov, of his hometown, all but 500 were deported to Treblinka, to the death camp. And about 500 were on a forced march to a labor camp in Sandomierz. So in literally two days, 6,500 Jews, 65% of this town vanished, gone in two days. So there's no question that he definitely felt that he had a mission. And I thought to myself, you know, I have to go to Poland. I know it's not going to be the Poland of my father's childhood. I, and I was going during martial law. I was going you know, to communist Poland, but I have to go. So in 81, I went, my father wouldn't go. He said, they can all go to hell. And I said, but I don't understand. You know, all of your accounts of your childhood are basically really, really good. You had an incredible childhood. I mean, people would give anything to have that kind of richness that you've described of growing up in your town. No. But then about seven years later, he said he wanted to go. So we went. And the first trip, he was very, very anxious, didn't want to spend any time, didn't talk to anybody. It was really, it was not a success. But then in the mid-90s, around 1995, we went to his hometown again. But this time, very, very different. He had photographs of his paintings and a little kind of photo album with those little plastic sleeves. And as we walked around the town, he started to buttonhole people. And he would open his little album up and he'd say, you see this? This was the mikvah. This was, this was the bath. This is where this was. This is where that was. And then like, most people didn't pay any attention. But there was one young man who took an interest. And my father said, well, does anybody remember anything before the war? This young man said, I'm going to call my grandmother. So he gets hold of his grandmother. And then all of us go to, to his home, which was two rooms, very much like the same situation my father lived in with his grandmother. And then the whole family piles in and all the neighbors come in and they get out the soda and the potato chips and the pretzels. And my father and his grandmother start talking in Polish. And from that moment on, from 1995 on, that young man stood, uh, stayed in contact with my father and followed every development, publication of the book, exhibition of his work at the Jewish Museum. And that young man convinced the county chief that my father should have an exhibition of his paintings in the town. Wow. And so I said, look, you know, we cannot give you the original paintings to show. You don't have the right facility, but my father will give a slide lecture. I'll, I'll, I'll organize the slides. I'll show them. He'll tell his stories. So we did. The town hall was filled, filled to capacity. Grandparents with grandchildren on their knees. And my father spoke his very old fashioned, you know, pre-war Polish. And they gave him a standing ovation. And but my young friend, our young friend said, the county chief isn't satisfied. He wants an exhibition. So I said, you know what? We can't give you the paintings, but I can give you very, very big digital files. You can print out beautiful, beautiful images from these digital files. So they did. We went for the exhibition. There was an opening and a ribbon cutting. And the mayor went into the town archives and made a copy of the wedding certificate of my grandparents. So from my point of view, that was already phenomenal. But that was not all. A couple of weeks later, we get an email from the high school art teacher saying that she told her students she, she wanted them to go around the town and find the places my father had remembered and to either draw them or photograph them as they appear today in comparison the way in which he remembered them and painted them. Then we got another message that on the, the Sunday that was either the same day or very close to the day that the Jews of Apatov were deported to Treblinka for the first time in over 60 years, this town commemorated the great deportation. What they did was they held a special mass in the church 
they lit blue and white candles. They had high school students read from eyewitness testimony of, of the deportation. They played Jewish music. And then they had the results of the competition. And then uh, more recently, there was an application for my father to, to be declared an honorary citizen of the town. And when I told my father this, because they tried earlier, didn't work, and they tried again uh, just in the last few months, my father said, what do you mean honorary citizen? I am a citizen. So I said, well, it's something extra, you know, because he didn't understand what that meant. But the few families that are from the, town, the older members of those families had wonderful conversations with my father and they were astonished that my father's memory of the pre-war period was better than theirs. They couldn't believe it because he remembered the names of teachers and the names of everybody that lived in all of the apartments and the people who ran the shops. I mean, his memory was just virtually photographic and they keep the prints and they use those prints of his paintings in the high school and for educational purposes and in presentations of the town. So much of the time when we think about those events, the war, the, uh, you know, extermination, you know, it's so large in the mind, you know, you can't really make sense of it. Why is it important to remember things like folk songs or recipes, you know, things that aren't the same um, you know, a lot of these things get lost now, but, but uh, why is it important that we remember these things? You know, when I think of the Holocaust, and I mean, I'm thinking of Poland, it's what I know best. We lost 3 million Polish Jews, and we also lost the world they created. And that to honor them, it's not enough to remember how they died. We have to honor them by remembering how they lived and by remembering what they created. And I think of it the way I think of Shiva. When you go to console a mourner during a shiva, you celebrate the life of the deceased. You do not sit there and commiserate over the death. First and foremost, you honor them by honoring the memory of how they lived. Recipes. You know, how do they come down to us now? You know, these happened all over Poland, all over Eastern Europe. There were different recipes. And uh, this is really how people ate. You know, do you still... Do you serve any of these recipes at your own dinner table ever? I have to be very interested in food and always have been right from childhood. Over the years, and actually starting in childhood, I have been collecting cookbooks. In time, I developed a professional interest in food studies, looking at the role of food and culture. And I developed a specialty in the study of Jewish food, thinking of it as Jewish culinary culture. I think of food and cultural terms, social political, economic, and not only culinary and gastronomic. My personal collection of cookbooks now is probably nearing 7,000 cookbooks. And within that, I have maybe 1,200 Jewish cookbooks. So I have one of the largest collections of Jewish cookbooks in private hands. And I have some, you know, really wonderful old cookbooks. My oldest, co my oldest Jewish cookbooks are from the 19th century. And of course, I, I collect all the way up to the present and I collect everything when it comes to Jewish cookbooks. There is a, a wonderful program each year between Christmas and New Year's called Yiddish New York. And last year, I did a program called Memories of the Yiddish Kitchen. And I invited the participants in this festival to send scans of recipes that are connected to what I call memories of the Yiddish kitchen and to bring them with the story that goes with them. So one person basically brought a Kestel, a little recipe box that in it, her, all of her mother's recipes on index cards and her mother might have like five re recipes for Rugeloch and she would then identify them. This is Eva's, this is Rivka's, this is Ruthie's. And, and, and in a way, it became like a map of her culinary friendships with, yeah. these, with these recipes. Somebody else had a, a relative that at the age of five was so mesmerized by the way his grandmother made shrudel that as an adult, he then wrote a little manuscript account with drawings of the cherry shrudel that his grandmother made. So they brought, and some of them were just stained kind of, you know, notes because they, you know, had grease stains on them. They, they just brought them in all shapes and forms. And the stories they told were amazing, including one really wonderful one. This is a, a family, quite an extended family that would normally get together her Rosh Hashanah and they would make their grandmother's apple cake. 
But this Rosh Hashanah, they couldn't get together. So what did they do? Each of the family, no matter where they were, anywhere in the world, each one made the apple cake and they gathered all their apple cakes together on Facebook, which I just thought was like totally brilliant. And, and then what we did was the coordinator the, uh, for this uh, festival, she, she went ahead and she put it together as a digital cookbook and then we shared it. So mm. that, that was Memories of Yiddish Kitchen. We're going to do it again because it was such a success. And I know that we'll get some great material. I have been following Jewish food focused Facebook groups. Well, unbelievable. And I'm now saying in the posts because if I were teaching, I would have a student do a dissertation on this material. So what are they? So there's one, which is a cookbook of children of Holocaust survivors. Now they are fantastic. Fantastic, because somehow or other, uh, these children grew up with women who are really old school Jewish cooks. Mm. So never mind cookbooks. They are living cookbooks. If you would like to really get these old school recipes, they are the ones that remember them from their childhood. And in many instances, actually know how to make these dishes. So that's one. I've been following it for a long time. And it's very touching because you know that they are the children of survivors. So these recipes hold a very, very special place that they experienced after the Holocaust, but that their mothers and grandmothers remember from before the Holocaust. So that's a very special one. Mm-hmm. But then there's another, there's another one where it, I would call it deep play because they're so interested in these Jewish foods that they mm. share all the versions and variations. Mm. You know, whether it's latkes or hamantaschen or chopped liver or gefilte fish, mm. whatever it might be, it's from an anthropological point of view, it is an ethnographer's dream because they are spontaneously generating all of this discussion and all of these sort of the fine points and the memories associated with them. So clearly, what I would say is that food is a kind of a reservoir of sensory memory, and it is very powerful. It's powerful through the senses and because it is also very emotional. There's a, there's a lot of feeling that is associated with essentially sensory memories, but then, of course, memories of people and of making these foods and of sharing them and of all of the sort of social life around them. So it's a just, it's a very rich topic. Very, yeah. very rich topic. There's so much to think about here. It's been wonderful. I got to go yeah. out there and try to get a, a recipe for borscht. So I might <laughs> privately email you. But this is um, the time to make a cold one, to make a chwadnik. Exactly. Make a cold beet borscht with kefir or buttermilk or yogurt. Yes, exactly. Oh, thank, thank you so you much, much for spending time with us. It was wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. It was my pleasure. Well, thank you very much for your interest. Thank you.